Well, good morning and welcome to another blistering hot Saturday morning. I am Matt Allen. Dave Riccio is off enjoying the heat somewhere. And you're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio here every Saturday at 11 on KTAR. And at Bumper to Bumper Radio, we are here to help you, the motoring public, the car owner, have a better overall car experience, whether it's a question on a repair, a prospective purchase, maybe you're wondering about your tires today. Uh, if you you have a problem, you have a question, and you don't even have to have a problem to give us a call, we encourage you to get involved in the show. It's a show for you. So give us a call at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. And today on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap, Summer Travel and how to take care of your tires and get your tires so that your your tires aren't one of those ones that you see on the side of the road. Always open phones. And I've brought in some help with me. Our, our resident, and I'm going to put you on the spot here, our resident tire expert, Rob Slegel from s s Tire, one of our great bumper-to-bumper guys. And I brought uh, Tim Nelson from my shop, Virginia Auto Service, to uh, help keep the conversation going. Guys? Good morning, Matt. Good morning. Rob, and I understand you were working today. You you took a little break out of your day to, to come over, huh? Yes, I did. Um, we have the uh, benefit of being open six days a week in two of our stores and seven days a week in the other stores. So it's all hands on deck right now. Well, now I guess it's make hay while the sun shines. I mean, this is when you're in the in the tire business, I guess your customers need you the most, right? That, that is correct. And yeah. we're there when they need us. Well, good. You know, the thing that, that, that brought this topic on was last Saturday I got drugged into going to Ikea. Not drugged as in drugged, but dragged along, I should say, by my wife. And, and I, I'm not a big shopper, but she wanted to go to Ikea, and I live up around 32nd Street uh, in Shea area. So my 15-mile drive or so down the 51, around the airport to I-10, there's nothing but tires littered all over the road. I mean, some of them are in the way where there actually could be – I guess it could be dangerous if you hit one on the road. It's definite road hazard that might cause some damage to your car. But which which each one of those pieces of of tire represents is someone who's having really a bad day. (laughs) I mean, that, that, that would be no fun. So what we wanted to talk about today is tire maintenance and, and how to help you avoid being one of those people that's on the side of the road, uh, if if you are unfortunately one of those people, what to do and how to maybe avoid having an accident or stay safe on the side of the road waiting for your tow truck or changing your tires. So, um, Rob, you, you see it every day. You're you you're the tire shop on Bumper to Bumper. You've got uh, three locations, I'll, I'll say, Peoria, uh, Surprise, and Avondale. And, and we were talking before the show, and you're seeing now – Tires are just, they're coming apart. They're, they're, if anything is on the margin, it's going to be put to the test now, right? So that, what's the biggest thing that you're seeing? That's correct. When the, uh, when the heat, when everything heats up, the tires, uh, the tires don't like that a bit. And uh, they're a lot like we are when, uh, when uh, things heat up out there, they start unraveling. So um, air pressure is probably the number one um, cause of a, of a tire failure and the lack of air pressure inside a tire. And that's the underinflation of the tire, and, and I believe what happens is underinflated. You, you know, a lot of people come and say, "Look, my tire looks low," and that's not the best, clearly not the best gauge. But you used to be able to look at a tire and tell it was low. But now with these small sidewalls on sports cars, and, and I guess it really doesn't even have to be a sports car anymore to have a to have a uh, a small sidewall. I mean, your four door sedans have that that low profile tire. You truly can't see, but that's where it builds the heat in that sidewall. Is that correct? And yep. then it, yes, it is. It's cor- that's correct, Matt. And uh, so what what we recommend is not the way it looks on the car is what is more than checking the door placard for the proper air pressure and making sure that the tires match that placard. And you took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to tell the listeners the best place to find the tire pressure is on on the inside of the door jam. There's a tire sticker. And that's going to have the proper tire size for the car. It's going to show the spare tire size is usually what we see. The spare tire pressure, which, by the way, when you're in your shop having service done, you need to be asking them, make sure your spare tire is checked. Tim, I know we 
at the shop, we the guys all the time are telling us about uh, spare tires that are flat. Yeah, we see that. Yeah, all the time because they have, maybe that have been checked. Um, they just you know people forget about that they're even there. And the, so um, it's so, something it's something to be definitely checked at on a, on a, when you have your um, your car serviced. And we're seeing the tire pressure light on more and more for the spare tire. But so use that tire placard for for your uh, tire pressures. Now this the uh, pressure indicator on the sidewall of the tire. You could use that as a guideline. I wouldn't really want to go to that pressure if my car weren't loaded down and full of full of family and, and packing items and such. That's the maximum pressure that that tire can handle at its maximum rated load, right, Rob? That is that is correct. And um, I don't really recommend using what it says on the tire, although there are some situations where you can. Um, but uh, but the, the better... The better choice is what the door says. And if I guess you have a question, it's go into your S&S tire location, go into your regular mechanic, and have them check your pressures and make a recommendation uh, for the setting. So that's the first thing is to check tire pressures. The next thing you want to look at, and your shop should be looking at it for you every time they're servicing the car or rotating the tires, but when you're doing your monthly or weekly car wash or whatever, you, however you take care of your car, you want to be looking at the sidewall of the tire, and I usually tell people to turn their front wheel t- to the right or to the left, and what that will do, it's going to expose a cross-section of the tread on both the front tires. So we want to look for even tire tread across the, across the tread, and then what are some other indicators that you might have a problem in this heat with your tire? Well, you want to watch for that even where both front and back, and it, you can't turn the back wheels, but it's not a it's not very hard to get down and maybe take a look from the back of the car to make sure that the tires are fairly evenly worn. And you want to look in the tread grooves for cracking. And you also, when the tires turned out on the front, and uh, you know, check for stuff that might be in the tread, you know, nails or or things that you know are, don't shouldn't be there. You know, we get a question a lot, too, and, and you you mentioned something that I didn't even think about. I was thinking more of the cracks or, or damage on the sidewall, but as well as the cracking in between the tread blocks of the tire. And a, a, a little cracks and a little bit is normal. Um, but when you start to see splits or, or these wide openings, you know, connecting several cracks, then, then I guess it's some time to roll it into your tire shop to have it looked at, right? Right, and have them evaluated. What about, and I went and did a tire plant tour once a couple of years ago, but a lot of people come and say, look at this thing on the side of my tire. There's a bubble there sometimes. Most of the time, that's no big deal, right? Yeah, that would, it's, um, I would describe it more as an indent, indentation of the tire. And that's really nothing more than where the material overlaps on the sidewall. So that point is really the strongest part of the tire. And so it, it uh, looks like a something abnormal, but it's uh, most manufacturers use that process, and so it shows up on the side of the tire. So just the seam, and then there's a couple things that that a uh, couple symptoms that we often hear in our shops when people come in with with a tire problem, or tire problem, or think there's a problem. I think one of the biggest misconceptions is people come in asking for an alignment when they actually have a tire issue or a shake, and I guess the most common would be a shake that you can maybe drive through at 45, maybe 47, 52 miles an hour. You can, it, it comes and then it goes. You drive through it as you go increase your speed. That's typically going to be a tire balance problem. But if you suddenly start getting that, that's something you're going to want to get in and have your tires looked at. But then the other one is the low speed wobble, that, that hip kind of movement at uh, maybe 5 to 12, 15 miles an hour. And what what do you typically find with that one? Uh, when you have a low speed wobble like that, that generally indicates that the uh, tire may be de- starting to delaminate, where the steel belts inside may be pulling away from the from the casing, and it'll the tire will be egg shaped. And sometimes it starts off just a little bit, and then it, especially in this heat, it grows very rapidly. Yeah, and you can look at the tire. I mean, you might see something. The, the, we say the tire is like an egg, and and it maybe just one section. There, maybe there's just a hump on one half of the tire just in one section. And that's the other thing. You need to be careful, and I've been bit, so to speak, a few times. You go to the 
check the tire and we're in a hurry or we just go out and we don't have a tool or a glove on and go slide your hand over that sidewall and then you get bit by this uh, mouth of steel belted uh, <laughs> tire hanging out so that's definitely no fun you want to you want to be careful with that or also Matt too you will get we'll get a, I'll get a customer that comes in that says uh, that asks, asks for an alignment because they say the car is pulling and it's a lot of times because it could be low on pressure or it could have a damaged tire. So that that's another thing that's that we see quite often. Absolutely. That, that's a good one, Tim. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk about what to do if you think you're having a blowout and how to, how to be safe on the side of the road and change that tire. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio on this hot Saturday almost afternoon. And we've been talking tires. And if you've got a tire question or any other problem, please give us a call at 602 602- 277-5827-602-277 KTAR. And the reason you want to call with your tire problems today, we've got Rob Slagle from SNS Tires uh, in to help answer tire questions. As you probably see driving down the freeway right now, if you're out on the road, I wouldn't be surprised that there's not someone pulled over with a flat tire or you're not dodging uh, <laughs> tire debris. Uh, uh, as you maneuver around town today doing your errands, if you're even brave enough to get outside. So we talked about um, how to avoid maybe having a problem, some tire maintenance, what happens when you have shakes and wobbles and the difference. But what do we, what do, we do if we have a flat tire? And knock on wood, find some wood in here. I've had a flat tire once. I've only ever had to change – a tire once in my in my life but you see people on the side of the road all the time so uh, i guess one is to make sure that we have a, a good spare but first off before we even get there what do we do how do we know we're having a flat tire i guess for me it would be an indication would be a a pull a pull yeah or a thunking noise thump 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 That's noise, it. or you get that wobble, yeah. and and if and if you get a, uh, you're just driving down the road, and all of a sudden your car starts pulling to the right or pulling to the left. That's the first thing that we check when we do it, have an alignment. If your car is pulling, it's the tire pressure. So if your light comes on, the tire pressure warning light, that's not just the, that dumb, annoying light. That's usually an issue, and that's why it's ever more important not to ignore that light. As well as as um, you don't want to have that blowout. We see we were talking about trailers earlier, Rob. You have a trailer tire blowout or a dually or any other car for that matter. If that tire blows out and that thing starts whipping around and you can't get off the freeway, you see thousands of dollars of damage sometimes on a car. So not only are you buying tires, but you're in the body shop. So if you have a blowout or if you start to notice those symptoms, get off the road where it's safe. When you can, as soon as you can. I don't think you need to make a panic lane change, or you should never panic anyway. But if you actually have a blowout on the front, the car is going to want to steer to the other side. So it's important to just hold steady, don't panic, keep cool, don't hit the brakes, especially if you're having a blowout on the rear. The car can, is going to feel weird. It's going to do all kinds of strange things. Just don't panic. Try to steer the car straight, stay off the brakes, get off the side of the road. But now once we've got off to the side of the road, we need to get off to the side of the road. Don't let the kids run around. Stay safe. Get out of the way. Call for your tow truck. Call your, your road service company and hopefully get the tire changed or be careful doing it yourself. Remember, I'll use a floor jack. Don't get underneath the car and use a wheel chalk. So just be safe out there. We're going to take some calls, and we do have open lines at 602-277-5827. And first up, we're going to go with Joe in Avondale on a 1990 Dodge Spirit. Joe, what can we help you with? Yeah, hey, guys. I have a uh, 90 Dodge Spirit, and it will not. It has a hard time starting. So I turn it over, and uh, it cranks for about five seconds. I turn it back off, turn it back on, and it starts right up. So I changed the spark plugs and the wires, and that didn't seem to help. Just wanted to, uh, to uh, my next option probably will be. So it starts up, and then it stalls. How long can you keep it running for? Have you tried feeding it any other type of fuel source, or, or what exactly, how long will it well, run no, for? No, it's, it, uh, it stays started. It runs fine after it does start, but it takes two or three times of long, long cranking to start it. Okay, so extended cranking time. It, is there any check engine lights or service engine soon lights, even though that's an early diagnostic version on that car? 
No. No. Okay. Well, it sounds to me like you that'd be typical of a of a low fuel pressure problem, okay. where where you know what you can try doing is try cycling the key two or three times next time before you start the car in the morning. So you're going to go on, off, on, off on and then start the car and if it starts then you might have a, a situation where you're losing fuel pressure you either have a, a weak fuel pump or you could have a fuel pressure regulator problem and the reason i asked about the check engine light is on the fuel pressure regulator on most cars there is a vacuum diaphragm and there's a vacuum hose so when you accelerate the engine actually decreases vacuum that fuel pressure regulator closes and helps increase fuel pressure to to make up for the load that, of fuel that the engine wants. Well, those rubber diaphragms break over time, so that, that will allow the pressure to bleed down. And in some cases, it will make the or it will make the engine run very rich, which would turn on some sort of check engine light, like a uh, rich condition, or on that old of a car, it might be an oxygen sensor warning light. So thanks for the question. And we're going to go next with Robert in Prescott. Robert has a 1998 Tahoe. Robert, how cool is Prescott today? Prescott's kind of warm today. It's about it's going to be about <laughs> 98, so it's a little bit cooler in Phoenix, but uh, it's going to get hot. My question is, I got a 1998 uh, Tahoe. I have no brake lights. I checked for the fuses, coming to make sure they had uh, power. Checked the you know power to the back lights. Checked the balls, and then I checked the owner's manual to see if they had a uh, circuit uh, or brake switch relay, and or a, a large fuse that would operate the brake lights. And I can't seem to locate either one. If you uh, and then you get down to check the brake light switch for the power coming in, it seems like they built the car around the brake light switch. <laughs> uh, so my question is, how do I find the uh, brake light relay? I mean, if I had to remove the uh, switch, do I go from the other side of the engine firewall, or do I go from underneath where it's really difficult to get to? Well, the brake light switch, I believe, on that car is going is to be up underneath the dash at the pedal, so you'd have to remove some panels. And if there's a brake light, light relay or some other kind of circuit. That would probably be on the underhood fuse box, but I believe yeah, I'm... that's that's where I checked there, and there is there's a slot for it because they have the uh, starter, they got the fuel pump, and they got the AC relay, but the slot for where the brake light sw- relay would be is not there. There's uh, no wires coming up in there. Well, and what may be the issue there is that fuse box probably shares with it that that probably shares that family of of Chevy truck. Um, up to you know maybe a, a heavy duty or something like that. So we're going to want to. Um, there's several things that we can check there. Um, check and see if your brake lights or your third brake light is working. Uh, body control module will be some, and I'm going to touch a little bit more on that when we get back from this this break. We'll follow up with that call for you. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Matt Allen, your KTAR car guy. And with me today, I've got Rob Slagle from SNS Tires helping us with tire questions and Tim Nelson from Virginia Auto Service. And before we took that uh, early break in the last segment, we were talking to Robert and Prescott about his Tahoe with a brake light issue. So, Robert, what I, w- what I wanted to say is that in that fuse panel that's in your car, that fuse panel probably is the same panel that's all the way into like a 3500 series or heavy duty truck that uses a brake light relay and yours probably doesn't use one so that therefore that's why it's not there it's just provisioned so they can use that panel in many different models but what i would be looking at one of the common problems on those chevy trucks the the tail light circuit boards go bad uh, you need to be looking at the if it has a trailer towing package. Make sure that you haven't backed up and bumped into something and, and broke some of those pins or or shorted them out. And be, and then the other quick diagnostic test for the brake light a lot of times is just go drive and see if the cruise control works. If the cruise control works, then chances are your brake light or brake pedal switch works too because the control cruise control controller or the body control module relies on a dual input typically from a brake light switch so if it sees that that's not working it is not going to let you set the cruise because there's no way to cancel it now so hopefully that helps you and if you need the best thing is to get a wiring diagram if you don't have access to to one yourself to buy one or maybe you know the public library you can go to all data online all data all a l l d a t a that's where a lot of shops get their technical information from and i think you can buy a day pass there as a as a consumer 
and, and that may help you or, or get a week pass. So hopefully that helps. And if you have any questions with that or if you need some additional help, you guys can always send us a message at bumper to bumperradio.com. Go to the Contact Us link, and Dave and I will help you with your questions or give you a personal referral. And that's also a good place to find in if you need a repair shop, if you need tires for your car in this heat, you're going to find s and Tire there, along with just a lot of good people to help you take care of your car. And again, phone number 602-277-5827 if you want us to help you with your car, your question. And first, this segment, we're going to go with Chris from Gilbert on his 2007 VW GTI. What can we help you with, Chris? Hey, Matt, I got two questions, if that's okay. Sure, go for it. Um, first one is, uh, last night I was driving my car, my check engine came on, and it seemed like there wasn't any more boost. Uh, feels like I lost some power, and I noticed that the uh, sound of my turbo is a little bit higher pitched than normal. Okay, so it's whining a bit? A little bit, yeah. Okay. And so I'm wondering if my my turbo is bad or if maybe it's the, the diverter valve or what do you think it could be? Well, there is those turbo boost valves that, that go bad on those. And they, typically they won't cause – I guess it could if it's causing too much boost. But you said you've lost power. If you had too much boost – um, you're definitely not going to have a lack of power. You're you're going to have excess power. Uh-huh. Uh, it's h- too hard to determine if the turbo is bad by l- just looking at the car. But we need to find out why. What that if the light? You said the light came on. We need to find out why that light came on. Mm-hmm. And, and then also make sure that you didn't blow off one of the turbo inlet lines. I'm not. I think on that model GTI, it does have an intercooler. Uh-huh. So just check those tubes and hoses and make sure you weren't in a high boost situation right before that and blew off one of the lines. Okay. So Okay, and then you had a second question. Yeah, um, my AC started going. It's not as cool as it used to be about a month ago. Um, and I had my um, compressor changed about two years ago. So I'm wondering if maybe there's a pressure valve somewhere that's maybe causing it. When I'm not, when I'm idling, it's warm, but when I get going, it cools off again, but not as cool as it used to be. Um, Would that maybe be a bad compressor again, or is there something else? I checked the pressure of the gas, and that that was fine, but um, I'm not sure if maybe there's something else could be causing that to not cool off. Okay. Well, it could be several things. That symptom, one tells me maybe if it's warm while you're sitting and better while you're driving, that's a lack of airflow issue across the radiator or across the condenser. So you need to be looking at restrictions across the radiator. Make sure the cooling fan is working. That car may have two cooling fans. And what happens, it's just it's just the air coming across the radiator needs to be there to dissipate the heat. So if you're sitting still and you turn the air conditioner on, both of those fans should be on. And then one of them should be cycling as if the air conditioning is not on, the other one should just cycle with the heat of the car. But you also always need to, not just the pressures on the air conditioning, these can be low by just a couple ounces and have an effect on the performance of the air conditioner. So you really need to get it into some place in, in where you're not using the you know the auto parts store can to just shoot some refrigerant in to where we can pull out and measure the weight of that refrigerant and then make sure you have the exactly the right amount. And even an overcharge by a couple ounces can cause problems. So let us know how that works out for you. Those are two good questions. And then so next we are gonna go with uh, Mike from Peoria on a two thousand one Toyota Sequoia. Mike, what can we help you with? Um, my question's on the coils for the truck. Um, we've had to take it in about four times to have coils replaced on it. Um, and now they've replaced them all, and um, it seems like we're still taking it in to have coils replaced. Do you know any information on that or I'm not, why that's happening? Well, I'm not sure of, a, of any particular inherent problems with the Toyota Sequoia with the ignition coils going bad, but what is your symptom or what's what's the reasoning that they want to replace ignition coils on the car? Um, it will, well, the engine light will come on and then the uh, some other lights will come on on the uh, Probably get a traction truck. control light maybe or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then uh, basically the truck will run very rough um, at idle, say, uh, at the light, and then when you get going, uh, you know, you still can get where you're going, but it's not running normal. Um, it'll just run rough. 
Um, it's like you're running on less cylinders. And then how many miles are in this vehicle? About 160. Okay. Well, there's several things that are going to cause an engine misfire. And one of them can be a coil. So I'm assuming there's, there's uh, some type of 300 series of code, which is a, a misfire code, and then it's going to narrow it down to the cylinder. We need to make sure we have good spark plugs. We need to make sure we have good spark plug wires and that we're using quality parts. If you're not using the, I think on that car, the Denso is the manufacturer who manufactures the coils for Toyota. You need to be using a good quality part, not just an Acme Auto Parts. I, I say auto part. But then there's a number of different things. We have vacuum leaks, Tim. You see them in the shop. People come in for a check engine light or come in for a misfire. And I'd say a equal majority of the time, it's not an ignition-related problem. Yeah, we'll see a vacuum leak that's causing the, uh, a, an issue that sounds like a, uh, a, a, like a coil problem, but it just happens to be a vacuum leak causing it. Yeah, and you're, what you're doing is you're sucking in unmetered air so the fuel mixture is off. We had an Audi not too long ago just absolutely kill us that we were chasing around and ended up having a bad computer. Uh, Hyundai the other day, we thought we had a computer problem. The car was misfiring, and we had already put a new ignition coil on it, and then we found the fuel injectors were cutting out. We thought we had a control issue with the fuel injectors. turned out it was a defective ignition coil. So, again, it's just make sure we're using a quality part. And if you've, if the shop is, is not sure, maybe it's time to, to change shops and, and take all your records and, and, and go in or go back to them. And, and just sit down and go over what you've done. You're going to be, need to leave the car with them for a little bit and just, just part ways and let them have some time so they're not under pressure to feel like they need to get the car back to you that day. So thanks for the call. And if we can help you, you can always reach us at bumper to bumper radiocom And we're going to go with Renee and Gilbert. Renee has a 2010 Chevy. What can we help you with, Renee? Well, yesterday I had to swerve to avoid a collision in front of me, and I swerved driver's side into a median curb and it the car jumped the curb and i went out and checked it and i didn't see any body damage but my tire was split on the sidewall the wheel looked okay and not dented so but the steering was goofed up it was all wonky you know it wasn't straight on it was tilted i was able to nurse the car home to my house and i don't really want to claim it with insurance because i got a thousand dollar deductible and i don't want all the consequences that come with that but I was just wondering, since I was able to drive it home, though the steering was, like I said, wonky, do you think all I need is a new tire and a wheel alignment, or am I just thinking it's a bowl of cherries and I'll get by cheap? Well, it's always good to be optimistic. I, you probably need a tire and you probably need an alignment. But, Rob, if she pulled into one of your SNS tire shops, what's your next step with that car? What's your course well, of action? I think be? the very first thing we do is, is drive it, obviously, to verify um, what the – uh, problems are and then I think we'd probably check the wheel for straightness and look at the tire now not all tires because they hit a curb get damaged I mean sometimes they'll have a superficial cut on the outside our rule of thumb is you know as long as the cords aren't exposed um, we'll, and there's no bubbles or anything in that general area the tire could be okay um, it's if if it, if it's deemed okay I would recommend you know checking it weekly to make sure that nothing comes back after the fact and then we'd uh, check the alignment and uh, see if we could get it back within spec without having to replace any parts these newer cars it doesn't take much to bend something so hopefully right. there's enough adjustment there to get it back into spec for her and then part of checking that tire rob you would put it up on and, and put the tire on the machine and check the balance and make sure it's rebalanced because i'm sure it's not that a balance at minimum right definitely okay. yes and then when we put oh, it, go ahead i was Renee. just going to say that i did see the cords it was split about 10 inches on the side so i did see the uh, the radial cords is oh. that what you're talking about yep it is so that's a I dead soldier there but yeah. um it came on with a service light on my dad's. So that was just because of the accident, right? There wouldn't it be. Yeah, I'm other... sure. I'm sure what happened is you you lost some pressure that, or something happened that compromised the tire pressure, and that that turned on the warning light. So okay. you you probably definitely bought a tire. And then what they're going to do, whatever shop you choose or your regular shop, they're going to put it up in the air, check the alignment. They're going to look for a bent control arm, a bent tie rod, and any of those steering or suspension components and maybe maybe you got away with one and uh, all you have to do is, is do an alignment replace the tire and then depending on the mileage 2010 you might consider replacing two tires 
or at least trying to match tires. I I always make a comparison. It's like wearing a flat in a heel or a penny loafer in a tennis shoe. It's okay if you put it on the back, and most tire shops will put the new tire on the back. But if they're not matched up, and then you go to rotate that tire, then you're back at the shop 5,000 miles after the new ones in a week after we just changed rotated the tires and the car doesn't drive right or it drives funny so that's why i like two and if you have to do one try and match so good question and good luck and hopefully you can can avoid that that insurance deductible it's 602-277-5827 602-277 ktar and when we come back how to get the most out of your air conditioner when you get in the car in this hot day Welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Matt Allen, and Dave Riccio is off uh, trying to get cool somewhere. I did talk to him this morning. I know he was mountain biking, but I think he is uh, northbound I-17 at this point. So, Dave, if you're listening, hopefully your tires are in good shape, which uh, I'm pretty sure they are because we just put them on. <laughs> so, yes, we did. <laughs> as we uh, talked about right before the end of the, the last segment about how to get the most out of your air conditioner right now so you get in your car it's burning hot it's been sitting out in the heat all day tim if someone says my air conditioner is not working so well and maybe it really is it just takes time to get it cooled down what's the best way to get cool air as fast as you can well i just real quick first i took a a, a temperature of a inside of a car yesterday afternoon at three o'clock it was black leather it was 206 degrees inside the car so but what i recommend doing is when you get in your car to open all your windows uh, turn your air on high volume and as you're starting to drive you don't want to have it on the recirculation you want to have it on the the air coming from outside because the inside of your car has hotter air than it is outside like i said it was 206 degrees and as you're driving you'll start to feel cool off roll your windows up and when it feels comfortable put it on the third speed because the third speed is your you're going to get your coolest temperature because on the high speed, you're just getting volume of air. Yeah, it's just blasting just over the blasting over there. Yeah, so, so. And then we're not talking about once you get driving as in a, a couple minutes down the road. This is all within a you know a couple hundred yards. Yeah, yeah. If get going. Get that hot air evacuated out of the car and then switch it over to recirculate. Yeah, because if you have it on the recirculation, you, all you're doing is recirculating that hot air inside the car. And it's hotter to cool. I mean, the, you said 206 degrees. Now, I know that was the temperature surface of the leather. Of the leather. And, and then the back seat of that same car in the shade was 187 degrees. Yeah, it was so. 20 degrees difference in the back seat. Yeah, watch your back of your thighs when you get in your car with a black leather interior. So up first this segment, we've got CJ from Mesa. Hopefully we can help him with his 2004 F-150. CJ, what can we do for you? Uh, thanks for taking my call. <clears throat> Quick question. I have a differential bolt in internal. It broke off, it punctured the case, and the oil leaked out. I took it to a shop, and they retightened all the bolts. They purged all the oil as far as the shavings and stuff like that. Said I needed a new differential. I told them, well, I didn't have money, so they have to put it back together as best they can. Drove another, let's call it 7,000 miles. Same thing occurred. I took it to the Ford dealership mm-hmm. because I didn't trust that. I, I thought it was suspicious to me. And the same thing, they purchased it out. Now another bolt internally broke. What do you they mean, purged, an, what do you mean they, an internal bolt? I'm not sure what you mean. Oh, I'm sorry. I just don't mean the exterior cover. That's all I meant. So yeah, a, ex- a bolt that holds the bearing cap on or a bolt yes. that holds the pinion? Uh, uh, hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I can I, Personally, I think that it was loosened when I had it in for some service. I think it was an unscrupulous dealership, or not dealership, but a place. That's just my gut telling me that. My question to you is this. I have two internal bolts missing. I need 20,000 miles out of my truck. What are your thoughts? 247,000 miles on my truck. Should I take the case off, make sure they're all tight, and begin in about 10,000 miles? Or should I just go with it and hope for the best? Well, I guess you can be a little bit proactive. I mean, I would find it hard to believe that. I mean, you've had this problem a couple of times. So the thought that a shop is going in there loosening something, I think that that's a stretch. And I'd hate to see or hear something like that going on. But it, 
I guess if, if you're having that problem in, in, in a predetermined amount of mileage the second time, maybe about halfway through that cycle, pull the cover off, check the bolt torque, and then put it back together, use a synthetic fluid, and hope for the best. Uh, I can't think of anything else. That's just strange to me. I don't know if there's any pattern failures on that car. And if there were, I'm sure the Ford dealership would would have known about that. So good luck to you on that one. And we're going to go with Joel and Mesa on a 2008 Nissan Titan. Joel, what can we help you with? Well, I have 132,000 miles on my truck. Um, what I've been noticing uh, is from a dead stop to when I start going, I get a clunk. It feels like uh, it's coming from the rear end area. The clunk, the uh, best way to describe it is like if you have a trailer, when you first start, you feel the trailer pull a little bit. That's a clunk. It doesn't sound bad doesn't feel bad, but it's not a normal clunk. Uh, I replaced my um, carrier bearing, thinking there might be something in there. Took the drive shaft to a drive shaft shop to check all of the yokes and also make sure everything's balanced. Everything was fine there. Um, my rear diff, the oil's always been changed at 50,000, and there's no shavings. It's clean oil. Want to know what you could think, what you might think it might be. Well, you covered everything I would <laughs> I would have mentioned. I, I hate to even bring this up, but sometimes we see those spare tire carriers get loose, you know, after all that he's been through. I'd hate for that to be, but I'd check your spare tire just for the heck you know of what? it. That might be it because uh, <laughs> uh, one thing that I noticed, too, is, like I said, from a dead stop to a motion, like to start going, I'd get the clunk. But if I actually started going slowly, like I didn't give gas on my gas or put gas on my gas pedal, uh, and I just started rolling for it, and then I give gas, I get the clunk. So Yeah, it could, it could be that. A good one, Rob. Good catch there. I mean, we we have noises and rattles and, and stuff in the car all the time, and we're mechanics, so we want to go looking for problems. And it's sometimes a matter of getting the junk out of your trunk. Get the golf clubs out. Get this. Make sure the spare tire is bolted down or, or, in that case, reeled back up the right way. And, and other than that, of course, our resident drivetrain and transmission expert, Dave Riccio, is is on vacation. So if you can it, check that stuff and if and maybe just follow up with us by email, and we can get you a referral to maybe Mesa Drive Shaft or, or uh, another shop in Mesa that can, can help you narrow that down. So thanks for the call. And we're going to get Ryan from Mesa with his 2000 GMC sh- uh, truck. What can we help you with, Ryan? Well, hey, guys. Um... I replaced the tires on my pickup truck uh, about five weeks ago. Um, they were pretty shot. Um, put brand new tires on it. Everything was fine. A week later, I commissioned Paul to replace the rear main seal. Um, it's a four by four. Put everything back together. Now what I'm getting is a real bad vibration. It's not tire vibration, but the whole truck just vibrates real bad between 55 and 65. Um, once I get to 67, 68, it goes away. I took it back to the tire shop. They checked the balance. Everything's good. Went out there, looked at it. Everything's true. Um, had them do a road force balance on it. Everything's good with the tires and the rims, but I still have this real bad, just a vibration. I mean, it just jars the truck real bad, like I said, between 55 and 65. So I'm wondering if maybe it could be the U-joints. Um, I did talk to um, uh, a gentleman at a tranny shop. Uh, he said that maybe one of the weights on the torque converter or the fly- flywheel could have popped off when they pulled the tranny out. Um, hey. I mean, which route should I go? Should I go with a, you know, have the drive line pulled off and check? Um, who, I did what, have the U-joints did, repl- I'm, I'm was, did you do the the engine seal repair yourself did you pull the transmission no, I transfer case no i i took it to uh an independent shop and had them do it um, okay well here's what i, I would just, do i would yeah. get it back to that shop to me it sounds like you could have a drive shaft that's out of phase so maybe what the shop might start doing is they might remove the drive shaft spin it 180 degrees and then retry it but if if you had if that was fine before they pulled the transmission out to do the the oil leak repair i'm thinking there's something in that process they could have left something loose they could have aggravated a condition that was already there it, it's really hard to say so i would start with going back to that shop work it through with them and, and i'm sure they can find the problem so good luck with that and as you're out driving around today go take a minute pop into your mechanic or go get your tire pressures checked make sure the tires are okay so you're not a statistic on the side of the road 
waiting for a tow truck. And Tim and Rob, thanks for helping me with the tire questions and all the questions today. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. We'll see you next week.